I'm Doug Robinson, and I'm here to talk about why people climb mountains. Maybe a little different topic for us, and how are you guys doing? It's the end of the third day, are you tired? <laughs> well, maybe this will be a little different. I hope so. Um, I haven't found much in the literature about this. I kind of, um, well, it all came to me because of experience. Starting in, I've been a climber and a guide for over 50 years, and I started noticing that I was having altered states of consciousness uh, from climbing. And then I happened to, at the same time, it was the 60s, I took psychedelics and I noticed the similarity between those experiences and so that led me to a, a lifetime um, study here and I've just... <laughs> I've just finished writing a book about this. I'm pretty excited about it. MAPS is going to publish the book. It'll be out in a couple months. And so I want to give you a little preview of some of the ideas that are involved here. Yes, gets us high. Ha. Remarkable practice. I think of climbing as a physical meditation. It's a way of focusing attention Pretty acutely, you can't be worried about much else except where you are and what you're doing right now when you're there. And that's, uh, that's pretty useful, and it's obviously one of those ancient ways into altered states of consciousness. I was interested to hear Roland Griffiths this morning talking about the relationship between meditation and taking um, psilocybin, for instance. I noticed the relationship between climbing and taking various drugs. So here's a guy on a hard climb, and I, it's um, safe to bet that his perceptions are about to be altered, his state of mind, from what he's doing. And I'll characterize that as um, physical effort and a degree of fear. Not a whole lot of fear, we'll go into that in a second, but um, often a whole lot of effort. So there are some assumptions that we have to get rid of first here, and the first one is that we're adrenaline junkies. And I, <laughs> it's not true, but this is permeated our culture to such an extent that I have to start out by saying, you know, by distancing climbers and other practitioners of what I, of the so-called extreme sports, those of us who are in these things don't like to hear them called that. Um, for us, it's more like normal living than being way out there. And in fact, I think it, that's, it leads to an important distinction. I believe that we're all it, we're all stimulus addiction people because we have, we are naturally have a low state of stimulation. Pretty easy for me to fall asleep in one of these lectures. <laughs> Anybody who's fallen asleep, raise your hand. But adrenaline is strong stuff. It was the first hormone to be discovered in 1893. It really founded the whole field of endocrinology based on Walter Cannon's work at Harvard in the early part of the 20th century, 1915. He published his major book on the subject and the field was launched and now we have some 69 uh, official body hormones according to Wikipedia the last time I looked. There and um, so it does very obvious things to you. If you've never had an adrenaline rush, um, congratulations. We don't like it because it's not fun. Adrenaline is not something, if you 
been through it that you would seek out and cheerfully do again. So this is a big part of busting the myth. I don't know if you can read this. I just had an adrenaline rush. It's very common. I believe it's not common at all. And the longer it is till my next big one, the better I'll like it. I think the most common experience for most of us of having an adrenaline rush is in one of these vehicles. <laughs> you know, you're droning up the freeway, nothing's going on, and all of a sudden something, the guy in the next lane almost sideswipes you or, or there's an, a near accident right in front of you, and uh, you go into a, a big adrenaline experience. And if you have an opportunity, the next time that happens, pull over the shoulder and watch it unfold in your body. And then notice what it's doing in your mind also. It's a pretty dark experience. It's more like full panic than like fun. And anybody here who has, a, did anybody have a different experience than that? With a, an, you know, what, what I'm calling a full-blown adrenaline response. How many climbers are in here? Yeah, I talked to a bunch of you guys beforehand. Thanks for coming. Um, especially want to hear feedback from you guys. And we're going to have be short on time. I better keep going. So yeah, here, you know, common cultural conception. These people look like they're right on the verge of a gigantic adrenaline experience. I don't think so. <laughs> adrenaline wannabes. Uh, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Um, but now you know, this is different, and I'll go into explaining what the differences are. But first, um, the, another big misconception in our culture is that runner's high is caused by this beta endorphin. This turns out also to be not true, or maybe only marginally true. And we have some good authorities here. The Solomon Snyder was involved in the discovery of the endorphin receptor in the early 1970s, Johns Hopkins, working with his grad student, Candace Pert. Um, and there was some fuss about who got how much uh, credit for what happened there. And this is Huda Akil, who is uh, certainly the leading expert of later generations in uh, beta endorphin. So three years ago, there was a story in the New York Times which said uh, the cover head was what really causes adrenaline, or runner's high. <laughs> and those two, their collective responses are right here to that idea. These guys are the experts in the country, as far as I know, in beta endorphin, what it does, how it works. And they're saying, no, this is not the cause of runner's high. You can all read this, right? OK. <laughs> so we got to start discriminating among drugs. Can you read this? <laughs> yeah, I guess it shows up well enough. <laughs> this is kind of an appropriate pre-Earth day. <laughs> Um, so we all have this kind of knowledge in us, whether we're conscious of it or not, of how to distinguish between one drug effect and another drug effect. And I'm probably, I'm going to hope that I can evoke a little bit of that from you in whatever experience you have that's relevant here. And, um, okay, now I'm going to start into, this is a little bit of a risk for me, but um, I have a... Um, I have a metaphor that, that I, I ended up throwing out of the introduction of the book, but it, because it's kind of challenging, but I think this group might be able to follow it, so here we go. We got um, my favorite range of mountains, the High Sierra, my home, really. Um, and imagine that it's a 1800 and this place is completely wild and unexplored, nobody knows anything about it, but it's in the way of the 49ers trying to get to California. And the explorers for about 30 years before them, including this guy, Kit Carson, love the heroic pose flag, uh, 
and he's been hyped up too, of course, but you know, a lot of times he was just riding around half lost on his horse through the gigantic west and trying to figure out where he was, and he figured it out before other people did, so he became a guide. Um, I kind of like his uh, last words. <laughs> to... <laughs> So, okay, Kit Carson is, is wandering around during the Fur Trapper Trader era and um, helping to really discover California and find, uh, for white people, excuse me, um, and, and find ways over the passes over the Sierra, including the pass that's named for him, Carson Pass. And not too long after that, um, Josiah Kirkwood came along and put up this log cabin. 1864, it uh, opened as a roadhouse with a dirt road and running in front of it. All right, flash forward to Prohibition era. Now it's the 30s. The road's still dirt in front, but there's a few cars going by. And the sheriff comes and ties up his Studebaker or whatever it is and, and uh, walks in. Well. The sheriff looks thirsty, so the uh, locals want to be hospitable, so they roll the bar over into the next county. It's prohibition, right? And uh, so the sheriff can drink with them. They're just trying to be polite. Well, they could only do that because, like, this was the only dwelling for 20 miles in every direction for most of its lifespan. And when the surveyors came and went, okay, we need to divide up counties here, they went, all right, well, let's make the middle of this room the intersection of three counties. So now today, if, uh, if I go to the bar and I get a beer, I'm in Alpine County, and I take it over by the fireplace to sit down and drink, I'm in El Dorado County, and if I go to the men's room, I'm in Amador County. So they really could roll the bar. The bar's nailed down now. <laughs> but this is, so here comes the metaphor. Um, there's the intersection in this unusual bar room of three counties. And we're going to call this being like the intersection of three fields of study. Maybe that's on my next slide. Yeah. Psychoneuroendocrinology. This is a powerful field that actually is going to inform our understanding of what of why people climb mountains. The neuro part's probably the most obvious. Endocrinology is, of course, the study of hormones. Um, I mentioned that there are 69 body hormones. If you look in Wikipedia now, they don't even have a page category for neuro hormones. That's how new that field is. Some people call them neuromodulators instead. They're roughly equivalent. Probably people wandering around here who would quell with that loudly, but they're pretty similar in my understanding of them. They work not in the neural way where one nerve almost meets the other and at the synapse um, chemicals jump the spark gap and carry the message onward. That's classic nerve action. Um, neurohormones in the brain are diffused. They come out of nerve endings that are identified. And for instance, if we want to talk about noradrenaline, and we will in a few minutes, there's, there are 12,000 12, uh, noradrenaline-releasing neurons on each side of the brain. But they just go spread out, and they release noradrenaline into the brain, and it sets some of the tone of consciousness, some of the, well, it, it's just awakeness, for starters. You're awake. You have a little more of it. You're alert. It's the sense of being alive, ready. You know, um, you can sit up in your chair even at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's, um, it's a neurohormone. There are maybe, I'll say, 20 just to have a number, um, including beta endorphin, but it's not very common in the brain, including adrenaline. It's pretty uncommon in the brain also. Okay, now fear. Um, 
is the other part of this equation. Endurance, obviously, if you hike uphill or climb uphill for hours, you're, you're certainly um, working your aerobic self. The fear part is a little harder to quantify, but one expert um, characterized several neurohormones being raised by fear, and interestingly, his list did not say adrenaline on it, but it did start out with noradrenaline. Norepinephrine, same thing, different words. So obviously, the fear thing is, is so obvious in climbing, you have to call it out anyway, but, um, and it's useful to us. I, you know, as a teacher of climbing, I, the very few students that scare me are the very few who show up and do not have a fear of heights. Because those people aren't going to pay attention enough to keep themselves safe. It's there for a reason. You fall off, you get hurt, or you die. It's rational to be afraid of heights. So as a guide, all I really like to do with anybody is just shift that a little from fear to respect. And then we can work with it. I don't want it overpowering anybody that, you know, you immobilized. So back to norepinephrine noradrenaline, it rises sharply in physical activity. So when you're climbing, there's a lot more of it in your brain. This happens to be in blood plasma, but it's the same deal in brain. Two other neurohormones, the other two of the, the big three that kind of run the place, are serotonin and dopamine. Um, my housemate found this. I love it. And then I started looking a little deeper, so to speak, and uh, find that uh, there's, you know, a lot of people are kind of interested. This is the serotonin molecule. And interestingly, it was first isolated as a hormone in the gut. And 99% of it in the human body is, is not in the brain. And yet it's one of the main three neurohormones that makes the brain what it is, that makes your consciousness what it is right now. And then I started finding it paired with um, dopamine. Now, dopamine you probably maybe know more readily is, is our pleasure hormone. You solve a math problem, you get a little jolt of dopamine that says, yeah, good work. Um, orgasm, it's a lot of dopamine. So anyway, this pairing of hormones start, started showing up, um, this is just a few weeks ago, I started to uh, find this. And then, so here, <laughs> we're, we're going to start calling this a hormonal cocktail. And so peeking out from under this little cocktail dress are the first three ingredients, the <laughs> noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin that are kind of the baseline of your brain function, and if they elevate, you start feeling better, happier, more alive, more functional, more, you got equanimity, you got role with it, um, and serotonin seems to do that especially. Um, so this is a pretty nice little cocktail to have going here for you, just from the hard work of running, skiing, climbing mountains, surfing, hang gliding, fill in the blanks, you know. <laughs> One of my neuroscience friends who I climb with, a guy who runs a, um, a stem cell lab at Stanford showed up wearing this t-shirt. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, electronics, simple. <laughs> Nervous system, way complex. You know the estimate, the physics, says that it's, it's going to take um, maybe 30 more years to get a full understanding of the physical universe. That estimate for uh, neuroscience is 200 years. It's the longest one in science. So we're up against some difficulties in trying to figure this stuff out, but okay. Now, I'm going to talk about two more ingredients to the hormonal cocktail that I think are there. And the first one is DMT. 
DMT has been found in healthy human brain tissue and in the pineal gland. Probably most of you know this stuff. Um, nobody knows why it's there. It's controversial even because it's been found in some studies and denied in other studies. And um, I recently had the uh, privilege of being told by a senior neuroscientist that this idea here is pure baloney. So expect resistance. The future is unwritten, even for that guy. OK, so the relationship, just so you might remember, serotonin is in the black. And if you lop off the hydroxyl group on the ring, and then you add um, two methyl groups out on the end, you have DMT. So the relationship is quite close. They're cousins. Nick Kazi is here, Nicholas Kazi, um, uh, and has presented, and he had just done a really important piece of work using a, um, a newer technology that is a thousand times more sensitive for finding trace elements in the brain, and DMT is a trace. If it's there at all, I'm pretty sure it's there, so we'll say it's there. Um, this machine, either the method is called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Don't worry, there's not going to be a test. Um, but he, this is just last August, he published uh, the results showing in the brain the, I'm going to go back for a second, um, not DMT, but the enzyme that produces DMT. Let's go back one more. There we go. So in order to add those two methyl groups onto the end of the tail of this compound, you need an enzyme called INMT. And it had been controversial too. Nick Kazi found it for sure um, robustly in um, the pineal gland and also in several parts of the brain. The implication is that it wouldn't be there unless it was doing something. And so now um, Rick Strassman, who wrote this book, some of you may be familiar with, is teaming up with a couple other researchers, and they are using the same method now to um, re-assay for DMT in human brain and pineal tissue. And I checking his website like again last night to see if the results are out. <laughs> Sorry, can't tell you yet for sure about that. So we'll leave the controversial part alone. Yes? Yeah, animal studies. You know, that's the catch-22 in research, right? You can, you can get, I can get you to talk about the tone of your experience. But I can't homogenize your brain and see what it correlates with. And you can homogenize rat brains, but you can't ask them much about, how are you feeling? <laughs> What's this like for you? <laughs> All right, so let's go to the less controversial part here. Um, and that is anandamide. Anybody know what this is? Know what this is? It's the human hormone counterpart of marijuana. It was discovered in the early 90s. This is THC, doesn't look a lot like the anandamide molecule. I'm running out of time here. Um, but this obviously has uh, what's our most popular recreational drug around the world as THC, and anandamide is a strong um, hormone equivalent of it. Does the same stuff in your body and in your brain pretty much across the board, they're, they're equivalent. So if you happen to have any experience in this realm, you know, you will know what an anandamide is like when it pops up in you. For instance, after uh, 50 minutes of an endurance activity like running or cycling at 70 to 80% of max, um, it rises sharply in people. So this, uh, <laughs> Anandamide is the current answer to what runner's high is. And it explains a lot of things, like why did casual 20-minute joggers feel gypped that they weren't getting a runner's high? Well, it takes 
more than twice as much effort to actually get to the point where it starts to ramp up in you, et cetera. So we'll, we'll move on. This, uh, this is another neuro hero, uh, child of the 60s. He isolated THC in 1964, and then um, an Israeli um, natural products chemist. And he, um, anytime you have any drug that works on a person, it implies that there's a receptor for it on nerve cells. And so it took a long time, until 1988, to find the receptors for marijuana. And then it turned out that uh, by 91, 92, they had the compound anandamide that fit those receptors. And it is indeed a brain hormone, whether there's a list for it or not. It does a lot of things. So here's our cocktail. We got noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, anandamide, and maybe, probably by me, DMT. These things fit with the experiential part of what I was putting together from like, what's happening to me? How do I get high on mountains? So they're essentially, um, I believe for now, that this is the explanation. And uh, if you haven't tried it, I'd invite you to. Flow states, you know, high concentration body flow. I love recruiting my body into this, or, you know, I like to think of it as a body mind, not the other way around. Stuff usually comes to me from the ground up. Deep play is another thing that's been tossed around as an explanation. You know, it's, it is meditative, it's serious because you could get hurt or killed. Um, Wendy, if you're here, this one's for you, just about bouldering. And thank goodness for the effects on consciousness. <laughs> you know, here we go. So this is a tentative cover for my book, which will be out in midsummer. Maps is publishing it. And thank you very much for your attention. I know we have another.